Just a couple of items of business before we get started. Um, the organizers have asked me that when the speakers have time for questions, to please not ask a question until the mic is brought to you so that everyone can hear the questions. And the other item of business is don't forget that the Super Social is tonight. And during the coffee break, you'll want to go over and pick up a drink ticket because that drink ticket will get you either, this is what I understand, three cappahanias or six beers. So you will want your drink ticket for the Super Social. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, I want to introduce myself. I'm Corey Moreau, um, and I'm really thrilled to be here today to share this exciting symposium with you. So first and foremost, we want to thank the people that were uh, provided funding to make this possible. Obviously, the Society for Systematic Biologists, but also um, Capespi, who provided some support to get uh, some of our speakers down here. Um, I also want to thank my co-organizers. Uh, this was truly a joint effort. Um, Ryan O'Mara, Tracy Heath, and then also Susan Perkins, who couldn't be here today. Um, but really, it was an exciting and fun um, opportunity to try to come up with these ideas with them. So how did we come up with the idea of this workshop or this symposium? Um, we actually do very different things. Two of us are empirical phylogeneticists, and two of us are theoretical phylogeneticists. So trying to think about how would we interweave our interest into something that also promoted diversity in science was, was not necessarily an easy task at first. And so we started thinking about the fact that theory informs you know, our empirical studies, but our empirical studies help shape how we think about that theory and how best to model what in fact we're seeing in nature. And so what we wanted to do was to bring both of these strengths together. And the way that we've done that is by having an outstanding lineup of speakers who are going to rotate between these themes. And so we have broader themes. So the first thing is macroevolutions. We'll have a presentation that's um, going to address both the theoretical, theoretical and empirical aspects of that topic. We'll also have people talking about gene trees, species trees, and lastly about phylogenetic and phylogenomic methods. Um, just to let you know, Jonathan Eisen is not here in person, but he will Skype in. He will both make a presentation, but also participate in our panel discussion at the end. So I hope that you'll be able to remain um, for that part as well. Um, so why is it that we felt it was necessary to sort of um, follow through with this idea of getting more women involved in the field of phylogenetics and evolutionary biology more generally? Um, one of the things we know is that women are underrepresented in the STEM fields, and that it's not a problem of their ability or desire, right? This is something that's well known. Obviously, we have an outstanding line of speakers that, that demonstrates this. Um, there are a couple of things that uh, are probably undermining or causing issues along the way, and one of which is that we know women often have a lot of self-doubt about their ability, uh, although you will see today that that's you know, certainly not reflected in what they're capable of. We know that there's a leaky pipeline in academia, and lastly, that women are, on average, underpaid compared to their male counterparts. So what does that look like? So what you're looking at here are um, average hourly earnings by gender. Um, and one of the things you'll know is the men are in blue and the red are, are women. Um, in the science fields, in the STEM fields, we're doing much better than the general population. But even then, women are only maybe making 86 cents on the dollar. So people talk about this concept of a leaky pipeline. Um, and what it essentially means is that we're seeing people drop out at, at each progression along their career trajectory. Um, this this uh, diagram is a little old, so we actually know women are, in many cases, more than 50% of the undergraduate population, and are entering PhD programs and eventually postdocs at higher rates than ever, but we're still seeing that attrition all the way down to the full professor level, and even at the highest level, in this case, the National Academy members. Um, one of the things we also know is that time's not going to fix this problem. So even though in the life sciences we're doing significantly better than many fields, what we have in this diagram, although maybe it's difficult to see, about 40% of untenured faculty are women. But again, at the tenured level, we're still not doing very well. And so people long argued, well, we just need to wait. With all these excellent women who have had these opportunities, soon they're going to be the you know, tenured professors and the National Academy members. But we now have 30 years of data that show that that's not happening, that women are still dropping out along the way and are not making it to the highest level within our fields. Um, one thing that's um, really unfortunate is we know that women on average earn fewer scholarly awards. Um, so this is a great opportunity at, at these meetings to ensure that we see that there is a shift there. Um, one of the things we also know is that women are not only less likely to be awarded those um, prizes, but they're also less likely to self-nominate. So I'd encourage all of you to nominate outstanding women um, for awards in your societies. 
Um, the other thing and I think that will be highlighted here is that this is not a women's only issue. So if it was just a room full of women talking to other women, although that's incredibly important from the aspect of mentorship, um, in order to overcome those barriers, we actually need broad support from everyone, and so I'm really excited to see so many people here today. Uh, but, but there are a lot of things that affect why women are feel um, disenfranchised by the community. Um, and we know that both men and women can be biased against women. The other thing is that we know that um, that we lose women across every aspect of that leaky pipeline. So really encouraging women to stay engaged. Now, the one thing I will say is that all of these issues are fixable, right? So that's what's really exciting, is that we're in a great time to overcome some of these barriers, both for women in science, but also diversity in science more generally. And so what I would just advocate all of us is to be aware of our biases and to work to overcome them, um, to encourage and, and support underrepresented groups in the STEM fields. Nominate women for prizes, um, and lastly, I think it's just ensuring that we're all participating in equality in science. Um, and with that, I really want to thank our um, invited speakers, our funding agency, and again, the co-organizers of this symposium, and with that, I'll hand over to Tracy to start the introductions.
done that the model we use for non-dating phylogenies is not really a mechanistic model giving rise to a fossils and extant species. So we don't have a real speciation extinction fossilization model. Rather, we define a prior for each fossil, and thus it's very up to those priors what kind of dated phylogenies we get, and we can't co-estimate any speciation extinction rates, which we are good might be interested in, so we are typically interested in also about the process, um, from our data. And so what um, we are thinking of on a process that we can use a model, a speciation extinction and fossilization model, giving rise to the data we look at, namely the molecular data, data and fossil data, and then to join the firms of all this data and get morphology together with speciation extinction rate estimates. And so this is essentially extending what people have been done, just looking at molecular phylogenies without fossils. There we just have speciation extinction and ask what kind of phylogeny we get and which rates best match a given phylogeny. And so I want to um, explain a little bit um, the underlying model assumptions. So we assume we have some species. Well, the summary lambda, they speciate. This is shown um, in this um, tree. We started sometime in the past with straight lambda. We have a speciation event, so branching event, the pick the tier blue, like lambda. And then the lineages, one of them might go extinct with straight mu, which is here indicated with the cross. The other lineage here speciates again, etc., etc., until we arrive at present. And in this little tie example, we would have seven surviving lineages. And then potentially, we didn't sample all the lineages, so we didn't know we haven't collected enough data. So here, we only sampled five lineages, or five species, denoted with the orange dots, and two tips are unsampled. And what is now new in this model compared to, so this model has been used for years for just giving rise to extent species phylogenies, but what we now added was this fossil observation rate, psi. So along any lineage, be it a lineage leading to extent species or be it a lineage going extinct later, we have this rate psi of actually a fossil was produced and we now dig it out and uh, use it in our data analysis. So all those brown dots of fossil samples. And to make it a little bit clearer, if I delete all the lineages of which we have no evidence for what happened, namely we have no fossils and they didn't lead to extant species, we have the so-called reconstructed phylogeny. This is not a phylogeny, the evolutionary tree connecting all our samples, so it's the extant species molecular samples, as well as in this example of four fossils. And the aim now is to use the data, so all those dots, and reconstruct the whole phylogeny. And here the crucial first step is that we have to be able to calculate the probability of such a phylogeny given our data and the parameters. And if we can do that, the data is fixed, and then we'll look for the phylogeny basically maximizing this probability or if it's based on statistics we get to the distribution. And so this slide is just to um, give you a flavor how such a probability looks like. The good news here is that um, one can set up kind of the calculation we want to calculate this probability, and we end up with an analytic solution for the probability of a tree. So we just have to plug in our branching times, fossil sampling times, a speciation extinction rate, and we get right away the probability, meaning we can easily use it in any context, it's not a computationally time-limiting step. So what we propose is, in addition to using the molecular data, we want to overlay it with the fossilized first test process. And now, in the first part of the talk, I want to explain to you how we use now just fossil, fossil ages, essentially. So when did the fossils appear in order to date the phylogenetic tree. And then in the second part, we add explicitly morphological evolution and do a true joint inference of given all available data. So in this first um, project, what we basically ask is, given we have our molecular data and we infer our extant species tree which is not yet dated, we have the genetic sequencing data, we 
we have fossil, fossil, fossil times, so they would be for whatever, say this is 5 million years ago, 6 million years ago, etc. And we assign fossils to clades. So, for example, we would say this fossil actually somehow belongs to the descendant of this lineage. And we, people do that at a priori of the analysis based on morphology. What then is the best time calibrated phylogeny explaining our data? And we do estimate this um, time calibrated phylogeny by implicitly estimating the fossil attachment times to the tree and integrate all the different parameters, speciation, extinction, and fossilization. So we average basically all what kind of parameters could have given rise to this phylogeny. And so the fossil attachment times, just to illustrate that, I mean, this fossil could have attached in this box, in this gray box, say on the left hand side here, on the right hand side, further at the stem lineage, or it was a direct ancestor of an extent species if it just fell on top of this lineage. Basically, we have to integrate over all those possibilities because we do not include here morphology explicitly, so we don't know where the fossil really falls. And if one does that, one can
example here that I read, those areas would be sampled more often. And in those layers depicted by S1, so roughly 150 million years ago, S2, 100 million years ago, and S3, 50 million years ago, we sampled way more. But then we still applied this, say, very basic method, assuming constant rates of fossilization to see do we get unbiased or biased results. And the good news was that we're still, the coverage is still around one, and the width of the intervals didn't increase much. And again, here we show if we use more, more fossils, we get smaller intervals. Tips in the tree. 
combination with morphological data and morphological evolution model, again, whatever your favorite one is, and infer the phylogenies with the fossils, extended species, as well as the speciation and extinction rates, which can give you or will give you some idea about evolution, macroevolution through time. And so here now we started collaborations, one with um, the beast team. So